Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third debate of term, and what a fantastic lineup of speakers we have for it. Um, I wanted very briefly at the start to say thank you to all of you who've reached out to me in what's been a tricky week. Um, it was sincerely appreciated. And I'd like to thank especially Patrick, who has sort of looked after the fort whilst I've been away. Uh, last debate last week was wonderful. It was fantastic. There was so much audience participation. It wasn't six separate speeches. It was a proper debate. Um, it was the same in week one, too. So I'm hoping that that spirit carries on through this debate, too. The motion before the House this evening that this House believes the future of Britain lies with America rather than Europe. Uh, rather like last week's debate, this was one that Sam and I found in the debate books um, going back in the past. So it's one we've done before. I think it was from the 80s. Um, but topical. Um, without any further ado, I will introduce the first speaker in proposition this evening, Professor Michael Clark. Professor Clark is a fellow of King's College London. He was Director General of the United Royal United Services Institute from 2017, or 2015 to 2017, and is now a Distinguished Fellow at Russell. You have the floor, Professor Clark. Uh, Mr. President, uh, members of this union, thank you very much. It's a very great pleasure to speak. I've never spoken here before. It's great. Love it. Um, and you're all, you're all round me. It's like theatre in the round. It's wonderful. So, uh, in proposing this motion that I think our future lies with America more than Europe, I want to go back 80 years. You'll love that, going back 80 years. I want to go back 80 years to November the uh, De December the 7th, 1941. It was the date on which the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, attacked the Americans at Pearl Harbor. And it was nine o'clock at night at Chequers. That was when the attack happened in British time. And Churchill was at Chequers, Winston Churchill. He was dining with Avril Harriman, the great interlocutor between uh, Britain and, and America, and uh, Winnant, John Winnant, who was the ambassador. And they had dinner, and they chatted after dinner. And at nine o'clock, Churchill put his little radio on. Radios in those days were enormous, but he had the little one. He was very proud of it. And he put this little radio on, and suddenly they got some news that there had been an attack on American shipping in Pearl Harbor, and suddenly the doors swung open and the staff of Chequers came rushing in, there's big, big news. And it was clear within five minutes that the Americans had been attacked at Pearl Harbor. And suddenly the place was, was a, a mound of, of, of activity. Everyone was on the phone doing cables. Churchill was very anxious to get the House of Commons back sitting on Monday. They weren't due back until the Tuesday. He wanted them back on the Monday so that he could stand up in the House of Commons and declare war on Japan. He'd always said that if the Japanese attack America, we'll declare war that day. And, or within 24 hours, and he got great satisfaction because of the time difference between London and Washington. He actually declared war on Japan before Roosevelt. He's very pleased about that. <laughs> but, but the point is, he then, in his, in his memoirs, he said that all this activity went on for two or three hours into the early hours of the morning. He said, I did it with the great gladness of heart. I was joyful because he said, I knew at that moment, the most important moment in the war for him, I knew at that moment we had won the war. He said, America is in the war, as he wrote, in it, into the neck, up to the death. And all the sacrifices of the last two years would not be wasted because now, with the United States, we had won the war. And he got very sentimental in his writing, as he always did, and he said, and as I ran round doing all the cables, I knew in my heart that England would live, Britain would live, the Commonwealth of Nations and the Empire would live. I mean, you could always see the tears on the page as he was writing it. And he said, at the end of that account, he said, and I went to bed, and I slept the sleep of the saved and the thankful. And the point is, although he was very sentimental about it, there was a real hard-nosed reality about that, that we were allied with the most powerful nation in the world. And however bad the next two or three years were going to be, and by God, they were bad. There were some terrible months to come. But nevertheless, the, the outcome, the ultimate outcome was never in doubt. That was a hard geopolitical reality. And there was something else as well, which people forget about because it was so huge, people seem to think it was normal. Think about this, the strategic decision which the Americans made in 1941. They were attacked out of the blue in the Pacific and they responded by sending most of their forces to Europe. A strange thing to do. Attacked in one area, but you send all your forces to another area. Now, they did that not because they liked the British or because Churchill persuaded them. They did it because they saw the nature of the problem the way we did. There was a coincidence of world view. And they realized, as we did, you've got to defeat fascism in Europe, and then you can go and do something about it uh, in East Asia. Then you can do the Pacific. And those two factors, the strong power, being with the strong power, and the strong power seeing the world the way you see it, those are the two fundamental geopolitical realities, not just of the 20th century, of 80 years ago, but now as well. Now, 
the last 20 years, my God, <laughs> the last 20 years have been a nightmare. We know it's been a nightmare for British-American relations. We were saddled with the Bush administration, which, you know, in my view, was the most arrogant and ignorant American administration in living memory until the Trump administration. <laughs> <laughs> Then the, the, the Obama administration, which was kind of right-minded but rather weak and ineffectual, didn't achieve what it wanted to achieve. And the Trump administration, which was just surreal. I mean, on the law of averages, it wasn't all bad, but it, most of it was. And that's been a really rotten time, a really rotten time for British-American relations, a hard time to be close to the Americans. But I go to something that Sir Kevin Tebbit said. Kevin Tebbit, many people here will know him very well. Um, he was the permanent undersecretary at the Ministry of Defence, the chief civil servant in the MOD, so in the Foreign Office, very distinguished. And he said something about the Iraq war in 2003, in that build-up to the, 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 the Iraq war. Lots of us, including a lot of people in the MOD, people like me and so on, we thought this is not going to end well, didn't think it was a good idea. But he said privately, and because he said it privately, I could never use it, but he then said it to the Chilcot inquiry, so now I can use it. LAUGHTER <laughs> And he said, he said, in that period, 2002, when we were working up to this operation, he said, we took the view, if the Americans are making a strategic blunder, we must not allow them to make it alone. What an astonishing thing to say. If they put their fingers in the fire, we will put our fingers in the fire. But what he was getting at is that an alliance is for good and bad. Bad times and good, through thick and thin. If they are making a blunder then we'll help, we'll go with them and we'll do what we can. And that's what Blair seemed to think. He thought, look, we'll be able to help them. We'll be able to sort this out. We'll be able to, to be a, a good ally. In fact, he was pretty well wrong about that. We couldn't help much at all. The whole thing, both Iraq and Afghanistan, was really pretty poor. But that, that nature, the, the idea that we stick with the Americans through thick and thin because they see the world essentially the way we see the world and because they're still the strongest power in the world is very important. And the other point he was getting at, I think, is this rules-based international order. We talk all the time about the need to maintain the rules-based international order. Well, those rules were established by three acronyms, UP, UK, USA. The United Provinces, the Dutch, the Dutch Maritime Empire, then Britain, the British 19th century empire, and then the United States, the US power which became an empire. Those rules were not established over the last 300 years by Germany or France or Italy or, or uh, anyone by Russia. I mean, it's interesting, we could have a debate as to why they weren't, but they were established, all those rules which now seem so natural were established by the great maritime powers. And that, those rules are the ones that we're now trying to uphold. And the, and the person who has, or the, the, the state that has the biggest uh, stake in those rules is the United States, and we have a pretty big stake in them as well because we helped design them. One last point. Go on. Surely the Iraq war is the prime example of not obeying the rules. Absolutely. Yep, yep, we have played fast and loose. I'm, I've been a constant critic of this. We have played fast and loose with the rules that we created over 300 years. And we ought to be bloody ashamed of ourselves. But it doesn't stop the rules being the rules. And it doesn't stop the nature of the, the problem still being the nature of the problem. I don't disagree. So, we now live in an era in which the geopolitical wheels are turning really fast. Those the big four countries in the world are America, China, uh, Russia and India, for different reasons, they are the big four. They make the weather for the rest of us. And those wheels are now turning. They're beginning to, beginning to look very like the mid-20th century, even the 19th century. And all of us European powers are trying to define our strategy in the space between those turning wheels. And that's why it's really important that a power like Britain acts as a link. Of course, I mean, inevitably, this is a debate, so we, we say either or. It's not really either or. I mean, it, really, you want, to, you want to do both. You want to be both European and transatlantic. But if we have to choose, if we have to choose, we should be a link to the transatlantic relationship because the best thing we can do for our American allies is be a good European security power. And the best thing we can do for our European friends is be a good transatlantic security power with the United States. There is something really important that we can do there. And I finish, I'll give you one final choice. Again, looking through history, looking through the last three, four hundred years. Europe, because of the nature of it, Europe's a very strange place. It's hard to define the boundaries. It's, it's as much an idea as anything else. Europe tends to be dominated by one power. I don't mean conquered necessarily, but dominated. It tends to revolve around one power. At one time, that power was France in the medieval period. In the early modern period, it was Spain with the Spanish Empire. It wouldn't be France or Spain now. Europe will be dominated either by Germany or Russia or the United States. 
Germany, Russia, or the United States. It won't be France, it won't be Spain, it won't be the Netherlands, it won't be Italy, it won't be, it won't be Finland or, or Poland. It'll be Germany or Russia or the United States. From a British perspective, who would you prefer? What is in our better interests? So I leave that thought with you. And as I go to bed tonight, I will sleep the sleep, probably not of the saved, but certainly of the thankful. And for those hard-nosed geopolitical reasons, not as sentimental as Churchill's, but with the same spirit in which he invested his text in uh, the 7th of uh, December, 1941, I invite you to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Clark, for that excellent speech. Uh, Mr. Grace at the back showed exactly how you can intervene uh, in a debate this evening, but I'm seeing, I've seen quite a few new faces. So on the back of your order paper, if you've got one, there are instructions. You don't need it. Um, at any time in one of the paper speaker's speeches, you can stand up and you can say basically anything to get their attention. Um, <laughs> point of information, on that point, will you give way? Within reason, of course, Alicia. Um, but uh, it's your right as members to intervene, so please do so. Um, we'll move swiftly on to the opposition this evening uh, and Councillor Peymana Assad. Peymana is an Obama leader of Europe 2020, a founder of the Labour Foreign Policy Group and a former parliamentary candidate. Peymana, you have the floor. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be speaking at the Union um, this evening, and it's great to be back in Cambridge for some lively debate. I'm going to offer you a different perspective. Um, and when writing my arguments for this motion, I kept coming back to this one issue around leadership, um, and very specifically Britain's leadership, uh, because sometimes it's not all about force. Sometimes it's about collective cooperation. Let me share a story with you on why. In the early hours of the 16th of August, last summer, a day after the Taliban takeover of Kabul, I sat in a British military convoy at the Baron Hotel on the outskirts of Kabul International Airport. Sat next to me was my father, and next to him was another Brit. In the seats in front were two British soldiers, one armed and the other driving. There were 12 other armed convoys like this in front and behind us, all carrying either British nationals or Afghan citizens who were being evacuated to safety. As the convoys approached the military side of Kabul airport, in the darkness of the morning, hundreds of Afghans, desperate to flee Taliban rule, had gathered outside the gates. As we waited for the gates to open, on both sides of the military convoy, we were surrounded by Afghan women, children, girls, boys, and men, waving their passports in their hands. As I looked out the window, the little girls, some aged three or four, were star staring straight back at me. They could see me, and I could see them. It was in this moment, the gravitas of the situation fell on me. The political ramifications of what was unfolding in my eyes was disastrous. I was witnessing, through the eyes of those little Afghan girls, the consequences of what failure in political leadership looks like. Afghans had been abandoned, once again, to a fate and to a regime they had not chosen. Since that day, Afghan girls have been banned from an education, women have been denied the right to work, free speech is denied, the right to protest is denied, whilst extrajudicial killings are commonplace across Afghanistan today. You might be wondering why I'm talking about Afghanistan when the motion is about Europe, America and Britain. I'm talking about Afghanistan because it's the perfect example of the decline of British political leadership within Europe and an awakening for Europe as a whole. After all, NATO was a British idea, one that our former European adversaries and the United States signed up to after World War II. Yet Britain could not convince its European allies that keeping a small force in Afghanistan without the US was a viable option worth pursuing together as a team. The Defence Secretary himself said he couldn't convince other like-minded nations. Many argue that Brexit Britain no longer enjoyed the standing it once had in the eyes of its European neighbours. Others might say it wasn't possible. European parliaments wouldn't vote for, for it without US backing. Whilst for me it was a strategic failure of British leadership in Europe, the lesson of Afghanistan points us towards an awakening, one we must realise and come to terms with. The US is not back, as President Biden claims. If Afghanistan teaches us anything, it's that the US will work with allies, sure, but when, only when it's leading the agenda and where its vital interests are at stake. 
It sees those stakes in the competition with China and Russia. America expects us to continue to follow it, even as it becomes a normal country, neither isolationist nor unilateral, whilst it continues to lead the agenda. 20 years ago, in response to the attack on 9-11, former Prime Minister Tony Blair pledged to his American counterpart, President George Bush, I will be with you, come what may. At the turn of this decade and at the end of this 20-year war in Afghanistan, where peace for the Afghans is still far off the distance, today's world demands a different vision. One where we no longer blindly follow America's promise. One where we can chart our own path based on our own vision for a better world. We stand at a pivotal moment, an awakening where we have to ask ourselves, what kind of Britain do we want? What kind of British foreign policy do we need? And our vision needs to be simple. Britain as a global actor, one with integrity, courage and consistency to deliver for the people of Britain, whilst at the same time making our world safer, more equal and more just. A Britain that protects the health of those without wealth and seeks security, which is too often threatened, and human rights, which are too often denied. Now, this isn't a speech about rejoining the European Union. We've been there, done that. Voted ourselves out of that alliance, and yet we continue to stand in the shadows, unable to take advantage of this moment to reinvent ourselves. Northern Ireland continues to be a question that the UK has yet to come to terms with. We've been through two years of a global pandemic that has seen livelihoods decimated, our institutions operate in crisis mode, and the UK's economy experienced the second worst growth among the G7, contracting by 1.5%. We see the rise of China as an economic powerhouse in both technology and science. All the while, it continues to deny human rights to the Uyghurs and puts them into concentration camps. Uh, Russia is... Sorry, uh, I give way. Um, first, your point about um, European powers in Afghanistan. Surely the reason why they couldn't stay is because they didn't have the military capacity. Um, then, to your point about Xinjiang, as they did both the United States and Hong Kong, both the US and the UK have a very strong We should be building our capacity. <laughs> On your first point, we should be building our capacity in terms of making sure that we have the ability to ally with our European allies and make sure that we can keep small forces in Afghanistan, which we potentially could have. On your second point, I think we haven't done enough to hold China to account. That's why Uyghurs are still in the situation that they are in. I will continue to make progress. Russia is knocking at our doorstep in Ukraine, threatening peace and security in Europe. A humanitarian refugee crisis continues to loom 21 miles away in the English Channel, where human beings, in, in an effort to escape conflict, try to find a better life, many of them losing their lives in Europe's seas, yet we continue to detain them and look at them as criminals. It is estimated that every year, more than 100,000 women are trafficked into Europe to be exploited for sex. With threats to free speech, rule of law, inclusiveness in Europe, and the rise in high unemployment, increase in cost of living, and lack of opportunities for young people, the answer to these challenges is not to ignore our European neighbours and throw around slogans about sovereignty and power, ignoring Europe for America. The answer is to understand that the challenges we face today are real. They won't go away and can only be solved with a strong partnership with Europe, today, tomorrow, and in the future. We are being outrun in the race to the top, be that in technology, infrastructure, education, fighting climate change. History teaches us much about Britain's role in shaping and leading Europe. For centuries, Europe nation, European nations individually colonized parts of the world, including the United States, and they fought wars against each other for world supremacy. Out of the carnage of the Second World War, political leaders had the vision to realize those days were gone and forged a close alliance with each other, one that saw peace prevail, the ruins of Europe rebuilt, people's health and life outcomes improve with the welfare state and economic growth on a scale unimagined. Britain and Europe have lived, worked and loved side by side because we understood that collective cooperation with our neighbors of promoting human rights, defending democracy, free speech, the right to protest increases our individual strengths. We cannot defend these principles anywhere in the world, not even in the United States, if these principles and values struggle in Europe. I mean, even the Ukrainians have learned the lesson from Afghanistan, with President Zelensky announcing a separate Ukrainian diplomatic initiative with Russia in December, so as not to wholly rely on the US-led negotiations. 
Now, I'm not saying we completely ignore the Americans. Sure, we can invite them for a cheese and wine party, as long as it's not in a national lockdown. But we cannot escape that we have deep political, <clears throat> social, and cultural ties to Europe that outdate the ones we have with the United States. We face the same challenges. As they arrive in mainland Europe, they wash up on our shores. I know we have the courage to stand up and say when something is wrong and to chart a moderate path to our future. And whilst I know that we have failed to grasp our leadership within Europe, in that moment that I was sitting as the gates opened at Kabul airport, and I, and I started to move towards the, the RAF plane. If there was anything that was clear to me on that day, <clears throat> as I sat opposite an Afghan girl, age 13, who sobbed the entire way to Dubai, was that Britain needs to chart a new path, one that does not rely on America's ideals and visions, but one that believes in the people of Britain, believes in a Britain that can work for people at home and work for people across Europe, so that together, through our collective cooperation, we increase our individual strength to fight for a more safer, more equal, and more just world. And on that note, <laughs> I urge you to oppose this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paymana. Uh, we move to a round of floor speeches. So we'll go proposition, opposition, abstention. Does anyone have a speech in proposition this evening? That was the first hand. So can we get a microphone to that gentleman there? Name and college, please, Sam. Because I'm not an expert in foreign policy and international diplomacy. Great Britain and the USA spend the required 2% of GDP on defence. Germany do not. If you really care about standing up, standing up to, to um, the Taliban in Afghanistan, then what you would do is spend 2% on defense. I will not listen to the idea that Europe cares about standing up to anti-democratic values in the Middle East when it refuses to spend the required 2% of GDP, and neither should you. Thank you very much. Um, Sam, anyone in opposition of the motion this evening? I think this is the first hand, but there'll be another opportunity. So just here, please. Uh, Mohammed Hassan Loan, Girton College. Yeah, Girton. <laughs> um, again, I'm not a particular, particularly good with you know, foreign uh, matters or diplomacy or anything like that, but when it comes to leadership and when it comes to deciding who our future lies with, I don't think we should blindly be following the American line on anything. I don't think we should be following any other country when it comes to anything. I think if we're talking about democracy and democratic principles, it should be us putting our values into our government and telling our government what we need them to do properly for us instead of following a different country's line, a different country's set of ideals and a different country's principles. I think we need to do better with our government before we start pressurizing other governments to do something. I think the responsibility lies with the people in this room and not people in the offices in other countries. We need to do better and we need to tell our government that they need to do better. It starts with us. It doesn't start overseas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I feel obliged to say that you do not have to be an expert in foreign policy to participate. <laughs> In this debate, you simply have to have a membership card. Uh, anyone in abstention this evening? You and I think, I think the hand at the back was first, so I'm going to go right to the very back. Is it, you can decide between the two of you, who is first? Right, <laughs> gentlemen at the back, please. We'll come to you next. Hello, uh, Lucas Mordi, St. Catharines. Um, I think one thing that this motion tonight fails to realise is a kind of middle ground. On either side of the aisle, we've got, um, we're arguing for a position which isn't necessarily going to have Britain's back. America, traditionally, has always put itself first, and we shouldn't blame it for it. But in the aftermath of World War II, um, having put a lot of money and having invested a lot in the American nuclear program, America didn't share its secrets with us. Um, coming back towards the Taliban, it's put its own position first before it's put British positions first. On the other hand, if we look towards Europe, partly out of our own doings, leaving the EU with Brexit, Europe will not put us first in these marginal, marginal decisions. Yeah? Can you clarify what you mean by did not share any of your secrets with you? Because I'm pretty sure you have tried to be five or something. 
So in the initial aftermath of World War II, the nuclear program put in place by America, Britain have, had heavily invested in during the Second World War. America was unwilling to open it up to, to, to the UK. It did sub subsequently in later years, but initially it didn't do so. So I think Europe has also put itself in a state where it's going to put itself first and will not put British interests first in marginal places. Look to the Galileo programme. We're having contributed to that as well. We're being shut out on some of the top level access. So I think if we're going through this, we need to find a middle path between the two. But we also need to look to what our own interests are and what are the popular interests in this country. And that's where we can look to places where we do share our values with places like in the Commonwealth, like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, where popular support for closer ties between these countries are at the highest compared to America or the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are absolutely um, uh, able to intervene in a floor speech too. Just stand up and say on that point. Um, we shall move swiftly to the second speaker in proposition this evening, Zachary Marsh. Zachary is an alumnus of Robinson College who read history from 2018 to 2021. Zachary, it's lovely to have you back. It seems only fitting speaking on this side of the house to start by quoting an American. And the great former president Ronald Reagan during and after his presidency liked to curate jokes about the Soviet Union. One of his favorites was about an American a Soviet and a Polish dog sat in a yard together, and the American dog said, one thing I like about this country is that if you bark long enough, you're going to get fed. The Soviet dog turned, looking perplexed, and said, what's food? <laughs> the Polish dog turned, looking even more perturbed, and said, what's bark? <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, when our Mr. President set out this motion, he said he wanted to have an angry debate about British unilateralism and strategic interest. But what actually does strategic interest mean? I'd argue that strategic interest fundamentally is code for the idea that foreign policy ought merely to be the art of the possible. It ought to be the art of moral relativism. And I'm here tonight to argue that foreign policy instead should be and is about values and that our values are better served and better protected by the United States. That we are better in the hands of a dog that knows how to bark for food than one that does not how to fight for it at all. Of course, where are we? Where actually are we? <laughs> yeah. We're really comparing the rich, prosperous, and capitalist nations of Europe with the Soviet Union as opposed to the United States, because that seems well, quite bizarre, to be honest. <laughs> I think in my erstwhile attempts at humour, you've perhaps overstated the extent to which my analogy is borne out. But I think it's important to bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that this motion at its heart is fundamentally vague. What, after all, is Britain's future? After Brexit, we are stuck with this nebulous slogan of global Britain. But what precisely does that mean? And I would argue that no one of this generation in here tonight has ever really understood a world or known a world free from American ascendancy and American hegemony. It has been 20 years since Francis Fukuyama wrote his end of history, and almost all of his conclusions have been turned on their head. And yet I would be willing to wager that the vast majority of you in this room tonight still believe that the greatest threat to liberal values is American overreach rather than the rise of authoritarian and despotism around the world. But make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, we see it in Ukraine at this very moment, the rise of a resurgent Russia. We are seeing the emergence of China as the full-throated authoritarian menace that it is banging on our door. It is buying up ports in Sri Lanka very soon through the Belt and Road Initiative. It will have bought lock, stock and barrel nations in Africa and in the Balkans. The values which this house, this nation purports to hold are under threat like they have never been before. And so tonight I posit that Britain's future is about defending those values in the words of America's greatest fictional president, the West Wing's Jedediah Bartlett. We are for freedom of speech everywhere. We're for freedom to worship everywhere. We're for freedom to learn for everybody. And because in our time, you can build a bomb in your country and bring it to my country, what goes on in your country is very much my business. And so we are for freedom from tyranny everywhere, whether in the guise of political oppression or economic slavery or religious fanaticism. That most fundamental idea cannot be met merely with our support. It must be met with our strength. 
The fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, that we are able to sit in this house tonight and have this debate because we do believe in these values and if they're good enough for us, then we should be willing to promote them and defend them where they are desired by millions around the world. But don't just take the word of a Cambridge alumnus for it. Look at the government's own integrated review published only last year. Democratic societies are the strongest supporters of an open and resilient international order. We must increase our efforts to protect open democratic societies and democratic values while they are being undermined. So if that is what Britain stands for, then where are those interests best served? Let's look at Europe first. I hope many of you in this house tonight are similar to me, aficionados of Yes Minister, that wonderful 1980s comedic programme. And I hope some of you can remember the moment at which Jim Hacker professes to being a secret nuclear unilateralist. And Sir Humphrey Appleby, aghast, returns and says, Russians? What Russians? It's to protect us against the French. <laughs> They're our allies now, but they've been our enemies for more of the part, most, most of the past 900 years. And jokes aside, ladies and gentlemen, the fact of the matter is that neighbours rarely make good allies. Because the reality is that our relationship with Europe will always be about those petty material concerns which define neighbourly and regional politics. Even without Brexit, our relationship with the European Union, particularly after we have detached ourselves from that body, will be about migration, it will be about border checks, it will be about fishing quotas. And that doesn't involve acrimony necessarily, but will nonetheless be framed in those terms. And when Cornish cod quotas can topple an alliance which is defending the very values this nation is built on and which are now under threat around the world, that is a fundamentally unstable alliance. But more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, Europe has fallen to the scourge of moral relativism. Let's look at Germany. The BBC published only earlier this week an excellent article in which it asked why Germany was not selling arms to Ukraine and it said that Germany had never quite got over World War II, that it remained a fundamentally pacifist nation. Europe, for understandable reasons, remains unwilling to stand up for itself, to again commit troops around the world in defence of Western values. And Germany in particular presents a troubling case, because what defines its approach on Ukraine? Is it the desire to defend one of the newest and most vulnerable democracies in Europe? No, it's not. It is a desire to fill German homes this winter with Russian oil and gas. Germany's most senior admiral only two weeks ago was forced to resign for saying that spheres of influence are a price to pay for lower fuel prices in Germany at this time. And we can't have allies who will sell themselves out so cheaply on the international stage. And it's not just Germany. Countries like Hungary, Poland, even now making overtures to China, willing to take the money with one hand even as they pretend and pay lip service to the ideals of the West with the other. Make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, that to get in bed with Europe at this crucial time is to take promises now, to take appeasement now, as Neville Chamberlain did in 1939 when he waved his piece of paper in the air, rather than to take actions and lines in the sand later which the United States offer us. So why do I stand with America aside from the issues of, of, of Europe, and I would not want you to think that I merely view the United States as the better of two bad options. I'd like to ask a question now. Does anyone in this room know what the second largest air force in the world is? Anybody? Yeah. Spot on, the US Navy. The United States military force is unparalleled. Compare that so the fact that in Germany in 2018 during NATO exercises, its infantry were equipped with broomsticks because they didn't have enough rifles to go around. If we are thinking about how we defend Western values at a time when they are more under siege than ever before, I would like to think that we have the material and the resources to do so rather than the promises of other countries that fail to live up to them as the floor speaker there so rightly mentioned in reference to NATO funding. And more importantly, our alliance with the United States possesses stability. We have an Atlantic Ocean between us. Our ties with the US are based on history and culture. They are less volatile. And of course, we've heard about Donald Trump tonight. I don't think anyone's going to look back on that moment in history, particularly charitably. But I would argue that it is precisely because we weren't so beladen by those close re regional relationships that might have constrained our alliance that we were able to wait out the storm 
Did someone say on that point? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. If you're comparing some nasty trolls on Twitter with the death of Uyghur Muslims in China, then I'm afraid it's you with the warped value system and not the United States. No, sure, go ahead. I'm enjoying this. Now, I dismissed it in... I dismissed it in the context of what we're discussing and the severity of what we're discussing tonight, but if we want to talk about social media in the bar afterwards, sure, yeah, I agree with you, but that's not what's on the ballot paper this evening. But more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, most importantly of all, values. I've had the great fortune to travel extensively throughout the United States and in one of the most polarised nations in the world. What is genuinely remarkable is that from small town hollers to big city streets, Republicans and Democrats live the values of democracy, of liberty, of justice more than anyone else in the world. No, thank you. <laughs> it is an example. And I, I think I'm going to come to what you're going to say anyway. It is an example that is borne out in dozens of constitutions of declarations of independence that look to the US's founding documents. It is an example admired by millions around the world looking for a better life. And the reality is somewhat irrelevant because that is nonetheless the perception these people have. And when it comes to the legitimacy of the United States, far more than the old colonial powers of Europe, is that, is that candle burning in the darkness. So I would conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by arguing that we should align ourselves with a nation with a global reach to stand firm both in Ukraine and in the South China Sea with the legitimacy to stand as the West's leader, not simply in Europe, but to nations that have experienced the horrors of imperialism around the world and one that has been willing to draw lines in the sand time and time again where Europe has merely faltered. And I will close as I began with the words of an American and with Abraham Lincoln at the turning point of the American Civil War at Gettysburg in 1863 that tonight we must decide whether we intend to allow government of the people, by the people, for the people, to vanish from the earth. I would argue we do not. I would argue that we are in the darkest moment of our times and that the United States offers us the very best that we can look for. And for that reason, I commend this motion to the House. Thank you. Uh, well, well done, Zach. A reminder that Zach was one of our um, student speakers this evening and he won his spot through open audition. Um, there are slots available to speak in every single debate that we hold this term um, and audition, uh, notifications about auditions go up every week, so please get involved. Um, the second speaker on opposition is Stephen Kinnock. Stephen has served as a member for Aberavon since 2015. He currently is the Shadow Minister for the Armed Forces and before that served as Shadow Foreign Minister. Stephen, I'm looking forward to your speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here as a proud alumnus of Queen's College, Cambridge. Could I say what an honour it is to return to my old stomping ground? I think the last time I was dressed like this in Cambridge, I was trying to climb over the wall at Trinity to crash the May ball, but <laughs> let's, um, let's leave that story right there. Uh, I graduated in June 1992, a time of seismic change and tremendous optimism. The Berlin Wall had just been torn down by the forces of liberty, self-determination and democracy. 
The Soviet Union had crumbled and the Cold War was over. The Maastricht Treaty establishing the European Union had been signed. The single market was up and running and as its architect, the United Kingdom was at the heart of the EU's flagship project. Meanwhile, our relationship with the United States had been, re had been reinforced by the important part that our armed forces had played in the coalition which drove Iraqi forces out of Kuwait in the first Gulf War. Fast forward 30 years, and what a contrast. Russia has massed well over 100,000 troops on the Ukrainian border, and the British government is mired in scandal whilst desperately trying to play catch up in the dif diplomatic effort to de-escalate. Last summer, President Biden didn't even bother to pick up the phone to Boris Johnson before deciding to withdraw from Afghanistan. And we are engaged in a seemingly endless war of words with the European Union over everything from fish to financial services to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Of course, I am not saying that Britain has left the stage completely. This year, we hosted the G7 and the COP26. And as a permanent member of the UN Security Council and the world's sixth largest economy, the United Kingdom certainly continues to have global significance. But if I were to compare our position and standing on the world stage in 1992 to our position and standing on the world stage in 2022, I would be forced to conclude that we have never been more diminished, isolated or marginalised. And this is particularly troubling at a time when democracy is in retreat. Authoritarian regimes outnumber democracies for the first time since 2001 across the world. And when China is ever more assertively promoting its so-called responsive authoritarianism as a systemic rival to democracy. Mr. President, prior to 2016, the question that's before this House this evening would simply not have been relevant or necessary but now it is a choice that we must all consider for the simple reason that we have left the European Union. However, the reality is that whilst the referendum result may have fundamentally altered our political and trading relationship with the European Union, it did not change the simple and timeless fact that this country's destiny is primarily determined by its geography and our physical proximity to continental Europe leads inexorably to the shared history, culture, values and interests that shape our European identity. Of course, Britain should always seek to engage politically, economically and institutionally with our allies, wherever they are. And we must remember that weakening ties with one partner or set of partners will inevitably weaken ties with them all. But if you can't engage constructively with your closest neighbours, then what chance have you got when you're attempting to strengthen ties with old, old friends who may be further afield, or indeed when you're seeking to forge new partnerships with countries on the other side of the world? The United Kingdom is in Europe, of Europe, and with Europe, regardless of Brexit. When Europe thrives, we thrive too. When Europe slumps, we slump too. And when Europe fights, we fight too. Of course, this doesn't mean that we should downgrade the transatlantic relationship or stop seeking to strengthen and build new trade, diplomatic and people-to-people -people connections around the world. But could I gently suggest that we temper these grand strategies with some hard-headed realism? Our relationship with the United States is, of course, of central importance. But the Americans are increasingly focused on the Indo-Pacific. And the spectre of the return of Donald Trump, or possibly something even worse, is looming larger every day. We must, therefore, be realistic and recognise that the special relationship alone cannot sustain our prosperity or our place in the world. In fact, we must accept the lessons of the Iraq war and conclude that an over-reliance on our transatlantic ties cannot possibly be in our national strategic interest. Meanwhile, some argue that we should now tilt 
towards the Indo-Pacific as a potential foreign policy priority. But I'm afraid that this is yet another example of global Britain boosterism and wishful thinking. Of course, it's important that we continue to strengthen and build our ties with democratic partners in the Pacific and in, in Asia, not least as a bulwark against an increasingly aggressive China. But sending an aircraft carrier to the other side of the world from time to time is unlikely to have a transformative effect. And military experts, both in the UK and the US, know that Britain will best serve its interests and the interests of the international order by focusing its resources on the security of Europe. And we should, of course, have confidence in our global role, but the global Britain rhetoric smacks more of a government that is driven more by an ideological aversion to Europe than it is by a strategy that is rooted in our national interest. On that point, I will give way. Have the past few days, weeks, shown that it has been often an Anglo-American push for security, particularly in Eastern Europe, and in the case of uh, much of our European partners, they have been particularly weak with Macron saying we must strive for a European Union-focused strategies to Ukraine, and Germany only sending 500 helmets. Meanwhile, we send God knows how many anti-tank rifles. Look, a lot has been said uh, by Germany in this debate, particularly by the previous speaker. Um, <laughs> And I do think that we have to recognise the historic reality of Germany and its place in the world. And I think that there's absolutely no doubt that that still plays a dominant role in the political discourse in Germany. But let's also recognise that NATO is a European and transatlantic alliance. And NATO has been front and centre of the discussions around what to do with Russia. Jens Stoltenberg, the uh, General Secretary of NATO, has been very prominent. So I think we should see this as an umbrella which includes Europe and the United States. I, don't thi I think otherwise it's a false binary. Germany is so worried about its historical responsibilities. Why is the fourth biggest arms export in the world? And, or, or is it more to do with German energy policy and a reliance on Russian energy, a reliance um, when, it, when it comes to Russia in terms of its, its export policy? If it was so bothered about its historical uh, position in the world in terms of causing conflict, would it be the fourth biggest arms export in the world? There are many things about German foreign, foreign policy that I am deeply opposed to. Uh, I think Germany has a mercantilist view of the world, and that is something to be regretted. But we're talking here about our relationship with Europe. Uh, I think there's tremendous potential for more military and security cooperation with France. Uh, France is a serious player militarily, spends its 2%. Uh, look at the Lancaster House Accords, huge uh, opportunities there for more military cooperation. What a pity that we have a Europhobic government that is burning all of those bridges and preventing us from uh, building uh, a new foreign policy. I'll take one more intervention. You, you made the point about uh, the United, uh, United Kingdom tilting at windmills for a bit, or, or global Britain boosterism. But you've also spoken about France as a great geopolitical power. If the Indo Pacific was not a place where the United Kingdom could play such a great role, why was, the, why was France so profoundly worried about AUKUS and the view that it was retreating <laughs> geopolitically in the Indo Pacific? Clearly, the Indo Pacific. Is, is a geopolitical future for not just the United Kingdom, but other European powers as well. And the United Kingdom should be talking about the, the Indo-Pacific is a very important uh, place, there's no doubt about that, but with the limited resources that we have, we have to make choices. Politics is about choices, strategic choices, based on geopolitical priorities, but based also on realism and the resources that are available. And the reality is that the uh, United States needs to be the first mover in the Indo-Pacific. Um, I welcome AUKUS, I think it's a very good initiative, but I think that the way it was done uh, behind the backs of the French was simply not helpful. It was childish and it ended up, um, I think, clouding what could have been otherwise a very good story. So having applied our reality check to both the transatlantic relationship and to the Indo-Pacific tilt, we are bound to conclude that whilst they are vitally important elements of British foreign policy, our number one priority must always be our engagement with our friends, partners and allies on the other side of the English Channel. And whether we like it or not, the first point of contact in this regard has to be the European Union. Yes, the institutions and alliances holding the EU together are complex and multi-layered, and this can at times be a source of frustration. 
But the fact is that we live in a complex and multi-layered world, a world in which there truly is strength in numbers. I've just been told I have one minute left and I've still got quite a lot of my speech to go, so I'm begging the forgiveness of the president, if I may. So having established the primacy of the EU in the past and present of British foreign policy, allow me to say a few words about the future relationship between the UK and the European Union. Whilst I regret the outcome of the 2016 referendum, I have always accepted it, and I argued for a form of Brexit that became known as Common Market 2.0, which would have seen us staying within the single market by joining the European Economic Area alongside Norway and Iceland, ultimately positioning the UK as a leading voice in an outer ring of non-EU pro-European countries. Common Market 2.0 was based on pragmatism and compromise, but sadly there wasn't much appetite for those quintessentially British virtues during the fevered, highly polarised days of 2016 20 to 2019. We've therefore ended up with a deal that far from being oven ready is a dog's dinner that's created, just to continue the dog theme, that's creating difficulties across every aspect of UK-EU relations. But we are where we are. We must look now forward with a combination of realism and optimism. We should concentrate our efforts on rebuilding the bridges that have been burned since 2016 with patience, pragmatism and attention to detail. By focusing on the technical issues that are causing so much difficulty, we can build confidence and create a broader, deeper political relationship. To conclude, the world has changed beyond recognition since I left this university in 92. Fukuyama's utopian end of history has re been replaced by an age of anxiety as China flexes its muscles and Russian troops mass on the Ukrainian border. But two facts have remained constant. The first is that Britain is still a country with huge potential and strength. And the second is that successful foreign policy requires careful analysis and sustained effort, not sound bites, hubris and wishful thinking. Britain alone is not a strategy. It is a dangerous fantasy that will set us on the road to, re to irrelevance. Let us instead forge a new European policy that sees us as a constructive partner of the EU, trading with minimum friction, building maximum dialogue so that we can strengthen our collective European security and prosperity. And let us use that reset with the EU as a springboard for strengthening and deepening our transatlantic ties. In short, let us get to work and start re-engaging with our European friends, partners and allies so that we can face the world and the future with confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I must say the quality of debate is very good this evening. It feels like it's in the balance, this debate, so I'm hoping a floor speech will swing it. Um, would anyone like to give a speech in proposition this evening? That hand was up before I'd even started speaking, so I'm going to give it to that gentleman there in the colourful shirt. Thank you. Um, this motion aside, I think it's... Sorry, Pat name, name and quality, oh, please. Sorry, uh, Trev, Trevelyan Wing, uh, Peterhouse. Um, uh, the motion aside, I think it's patently obvious that the future of Britain lies both with the United States as well as with Europe. Um, but <laughs> given that the motion is what it is, um, I figure this is the side I think I, I feel uh, more drawn to tonight. The reason for that, as I said before, I am I'm American, I'm from Hong Kong, as I said before, but I did spend um, uh, a large portion of my formative years, my adolescence, growing up in Europe, on the continent, as you say over here, um, in Germany mainly, in France and Sweden as well. Um, I first moved to the UK in uh, 2015 to study at the other place, um, and at the time, I couldn't really understand why you wanted to leave the European Union. I was very much, and I still am, you know, pro-European, I believe in the European ideal, um, but the, the majority of people in this country voted otherwise. So I, actually, I think the majority of people in this country, whether, you know, the, the motion is, you know, what, where the future of Britain lies. Well, the majority of people in this country have voted, you know, that it doesn't actually lie with Britain, which I think many of us here would disagree with, but rather perhaps with the United States. I think one of the things that recent years has shown, um, especially through the COVID pandemic, is that in terms of how we see the world, and especially in terms of how we value, for example, individual freedom, 
the UK and the US actually share a lot more in common. I mean, when I'm back in Asia, when I'm in other European countries, and there are Brits there, and Australians, and Canadians, and New Zealanders, and Americans, those are the people that tend to hang together, and then, you know, you have the Germans and then the other Europeans um, as well. And of course, we mix and we're all friendly together. But I think there's a reason for that. We've seen through the pandemic, for example, um, yes, please. I, I don't think it's just a common language. Um, I speak six. I mean, um, I think what, what, I, what I would say is though, what we've seen through the pandemic, what we've seen through the pandemic um, is the fact that in this country, and for example in the US, there has been a strong unwillingness to the extent that's been possible to confine, say, individual freedom. Again, in this country, we've had multiple national lockdowns, which you know, many of us have lived through here in Cambridge or elsewhere in this country. Um, but we haven't heard the kinds of statements that have come out of continental European countries. Macron saying that he wants to make the lives of the unvaccinated really, really, really difficult. I'm paraphrasing. Um, I'm someone who's, I believe in vaccination, but at the same time, I believe in the freedom of a human being to decide what to put into their body. You know, we've seen, you know, the, the head of the European Commission, you know, essentially making it very difficult for vaccine shipments to be sent to Australia. I have Australian friends here who were really upset when that happened. Um, so I guess, long story short, um, I believe that the future of this country obviously lies both with the United States as well as with Europe. But the majority of people in this country in 2016 voted otherwise. And I think maybe that's not such a bad thing. Thank you, Trev. Would anyone like to speak in opposition this evening? Maria Talnikov, Downing College. Um, God, where do I start? Um, I emphatically disagree with the guy who just spoke. <laughs> Americans and British will never be friends. That just does not happen. I'm telling you. Um, as someone who is, what, Zachary? Is that Zach? Yeah. May I call you Zach? Um, as, a, as a Soviet, as the child of a Soviet dog, Soviet dogs, um, I like fundamentally take issue with this idea that Russia is something to be feared, right? And that we should, we should just hold on to America for dear life because they're going to save us. I think it's really telling that um, Zach, we're now friends, um, <laughs> use the quote of a fake president, because everything about America is fake. <laughs> I mean, we've all watched The West Wing and its super idealized vision of what America looks like, and for some reason, we believe that. It's really strange. Like, we want to believe in the Disney fairy tale of America. Yes. <laughs> Oh, I remember you spoke about America before. Go on. <laughs> what have I done? Sorry, say that. Sorry, say that again. Yes. No. Um. I, I do think that's all I have to say. I could say something more controversial about how I don't think there's going to be a war, but <laughs> in Ukraine, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> we'll find out. Right. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, hold on, I'm gonna do two rounds, if we can be pithy. You, you, want, you had your hand up in the first round, so why don't you go first in abstention? Fantastic. Nice and pithy, please, and then I'll try and get through another round. 
Hi, uh, yeah, I'll keep it very quick. Uh, I'm not British, I'm not from Europe, I'm not American, I'm Arab, and I'm really tired of all this talk about common values and liberty and democracy and freedom. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear who spent their 2% GDP and who's done this. Because let's be real, both places have done some pretty terrible things, okay? If, whether it's the US propping up uh, authoritarian governments and in, as and when it suited it during the Cold War, uh, whether it's the EU-Libya migrant deal, which is honestly one of the most shocking and flagrant human rights abuses I've seen to this day. And again, Arab, so quite a few down the line there. I just think that by saying that we have common values with the US, with the EU, you know what, let's be real here. These are interest-based decisions. Foreign policy is interest-based decisions. And we don't do ourselves any good by pretending that we share some abstract notions of freedom, whether it's, I don't know, the freedom not to get vaccinated or whether it's some other form of liberty. I'm not really that interested and hearing it, whether you think the problem is that the US has too much power and acts like an undisciplined hegemon, yeah. Whether you think the problem is that the EU has too little power and so is unable to make an effective stand in foreign policy, yeah. You know what? Maybe that is why I am in abstention because I don't think we should rely holistically on one or the other since both are deeply flawed. I could go into a lot more, but I understand that we're on time constraints. So please, can we just cut out this talk of values? We've seen those values. We've seen them in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya, in Yemen, where US and the UK are funding one of the most horrific wars ever. We've seen it in relationships with MBS from Saudi. We've seen it in some of the most controversial foreign policy decisions. So please, no more about, yeah? Uh, I mean, I, I <laughs> But it's a politics oriented towards a negative ethical horizon. It's a value that allows choice, a value that allows ignorance, a value that allows mistakes. The values that are against which we are opposing, whether it be Russia or China or any other um, competitive uh, competing political system, is one in which values and decisions are predetermined. And is that why you're also supporting Saudi Arabia in Yemen and Israel and a host of other countries with deplorable human rights records in terms of making choices? I'm, I'm all for, I am all for combating authoritarianism, believe me, but if you're going to do it, do it wholesale, don't pick and choose, and don't believe that one side is more privileged than the other. Either do it completely or stop kidding yourself. Thank you very much. Right, we are making good time. I will, there's members that want to speak, so I'll do this. It has to be less than a minute. So, in proposition... I think, I think it was you, but I think that's off the last round. Name and college, please. Less than a minute. Derek, Clare College. Um, I'm a mathematician, so famously divorced from reality, but let me just give, me, give my two cents here. Um, it's very clear to me that the hierarchy of the world is under, uh, under flux. Um, powers are shifting, and uh, centers of powers are shifting. If you're going to align yourself with you know, Europe or America, like who's part of the, the deal with, with, um, with Australia, with with the nuclear submarines. Who has nuclear weapons? America does, Europe doesn't. Who has... <laughs> no, I'm not, I, I'm not smart enough to like take any, any, any criticism. <laughs> um, um, America has more money and honestly, politics, you can, you can pretend it's about values, it's not about values, it's always about money, it's always about power, we're humans. Who has the money? America has the money. When you, when you, you already divorced yourself from Europe. You know, find a new wife. <laughs> okay, and then the last point I'll make. Once you get your wonderful free trade agreement with Americans, you'll survive the chlorinated chicken. I grew up on it. It's really fine. Um, <laughs> um, I have more to say. That's it. Abstention. Okay, I'll do afterwards. As I said, the quality of debate this evening, extremely high. <laughs> uh, that gentleman at the back in opposition. 
Hi, uh, I'm James at Maudlin. Um, I'd just like to say that American politics at the moment is very volatile. Um, we see Trump may come back in 2024. And can we really trust America to represent British interests in the future and at the moment? So as we saw with Afghanistan, we weren't consulted about America pulling out. America just did it. And so my question is this. Surely we should just come, um, we should try and cultivate a better relationship with Europe because America at the moment is increasingly volatile, it's increasingly acting in its own interests, and therefore, surely it's better for us to cultivate better ties with the neighbours. What? Hungary, Poland, let's think about those. Those are all very technical and very cheap in the Europe price. It's all across the world, let's be honest. Yeah, sure, but the main, the main, um, the main players in Europe, though, are the E3, so that's us, France, and Germany. And they are democratic countries, and if we cultivate ties with the Western countries in Europe, surely we could build something that's much more constructive and be able to stand up for a European interest. On that point, completely, completely agree the US has been extremely undependable, um, but I guess the question is, can you actually depend on Europe to stand up, whether to Russia, whether to China, whether to Saudi, for example, or any of these others? Because from what I can see, they're doing very little of anything. Uh, yeah, for sure. I take your point, but I think that the way things are heading, the US is becoming more and more volatile, whereas there is opportunity for us to cultivate better relationships with Europe. So in kind of where things are heading, I think that there is scope for things to get better with Europe. So. That's got to go back there. I, I, it was the chap at the back, he was in the first round, so I'm going to go to him. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you, sir. David Barotto, Wolfen College. And after facing so much rejection, oh, so glad to have the mic. Now, I'm new to this country. I don't know what gets played on TV here, so I might have to forgive the second speaker in uh, proposition. But I'd like to ask what you were watching on TV on January 6, 2021, because I know what I was watching. I was in Brockville, Ontario, walking along the St. Lawrence River with New York State right across on the other side. And on my phone, I was looking at what was going on in Washington as the capital was under siege, as American democracy was going to shit, for lack of a better language. The whole proposition argument is based on the fact that America is a bastion of strength, stability, and democracy. And we can see today, we saw last year, that that's not the case anymore. I'll, I'll have it. The fact that they needed to do so under such duress shows how shaky American democracy is right now. And so if we look from 2016 to 2020, the Trump presidency tells you all it is. If you look at how weak the Biden presidency is now, and you, I won't have it. If you look at the uncertainty of what's gonna happen in 2024, we know that America might not be the best place to go. Now, I don't know anything about Europe. America is not looking that great. For me, this debate is very binary, which is my point in abstention comes in. Join Canada. We have poutine, we have beavers, we're much more friendly. Our reputation in the world is much better than anyone in Europe or in America. We're clearly the place to go. Abstain. Canada is where we need to be. Um, I, I have to move on. I'm so glad that all members want to get involved, but um, it's getting to about half past, so I better give it to the final two paper speakers to conclude. Uh, to that end, Alicia. Alicia Kearns is the MP for Rutland and Melton and a member of both the Foreign Affairs and National Security Strategy Joint Committee. She's also an alumnus of Fitzwilliam College. Alicia, you have the floor. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, as a Fitzbilly, it's great to be back here. Um, although I would say that perhaps my speakers on the floor have answered all the questions, so I will take interventions about the pork pie plot and the future of this government instead, which might be a topic for discussion. Um, look, there are two nations that in their history have had the confidence to shed their past, to say they want to set their own destiny and to say they want to take their fate in their own hands. One in 1776 and one in 2016. But this is not 
all that unites us. <laughs> now, when I saw this motion, the thought came to me, as perhaps it did to you, sir, that this shouldn't be a binary choice. But the choice is ours. The clearest ambition, in my view, for the next decade of British foreign policy should be the creation of a constellation of alliances around the world to protect our people and to protect our interests, to expand our trade links and to manage the ge biggest geopolitical question since the Second World War, which is the rise of China. But as you may deduce, I do believe that America is the key partner in this. There is only one partner who will be with us, alongside us, and decisively shares our values as we seek to secure these alliances and secure them around the world. They have stood almost always with us, side by side, because no partner is perfect, and I'm not going to try and suggest to you tonight that they are. But there is no greater alliance than that between Great Britain and the United States. Never before have two countries shared so much. Never before has there been a relationship where you can be so critical of the other, behind the doors and publicly, and continue to work together. A shared language, cultural links, economic relationships, military alliances, a common base of political values. No two nations stand more steadfast on the international stage. Now, Britain's future should lie with America, but actually, all of our values and approach and efforts and interests guarantee that it absolutely must. Now, I'm not just going to heap praise on our cousins across the pond, because it isn't perfect, and there are many who will criticise that relationship this evening, and there are many recent events... Please. How can you expect America to stand up for Western values and abide the past legislation Well, some might suggest that if you look at current British politics, sometimes your ability to do things domestically are not exactly the same as what you are doing in Ukraine. Some might argue that domestically, currently, we're in a bit of a pickle. There's a bit too much cake going round. However, in Ukraine, we are the foremost force standing up for the Ukrainian people. And I say that as someone who was in Ukraine two weeks ago, in the last Ukrainian-held territory, in the last building 100 metres from the Russians. And I can reassure you of this. The Ukrainians name one country and one country only when they talk about who's supporting them most, and that is the UK. So you can have a very different standing domestically to where you are internationally. Now... We have been able to resolve disputes time and time again through frank conversation. And my question is, why chart a course through a minefield when a clear channel already exists? Now, I note the motion talks about Europe, but I think it's quite clear that we're talking about the European Union here, so I will try not to use them interchangeably. The European Union, in my view, is fundamentally incapable of acting as a geopolitical actor on the world stage. This single-handedly, in my view, guarantees that Britain's future must face towards the US. The international era as we, uh, order, as we heard this evening, is under threat. There is no question of that. And whilst I can see that this is an order that was created by American hegemony, it has overwhelmingly benefited us in the UK and also the European continent. The end of history has failed to materialise, and countries are desperately picking up pens to try and write an additional chapter, but the EU is struggling to even assemble one. 27 countries cannot have shared interests, um, dif diverse interests, but a unified foreign policy. It's almost so plain that it doesn't deserve for, for more, uh, further explanation. The current crisis in UK, Ukraine, as I say, absolutely illustrates this. Predictably, EU states, please. You, you said that the European states can manage a common foreign policy, but they've been fairly successful when it comes to breaking the have they not, in terms of preventing a unified problem. I have to say, I'm not convinced that, you, that, you, that, that the EU did. I don't think the deal was horrendous. I think everyone said it was going to be impossible to get a deal that was in any way successful, in any way would allow us to function. But our country is not falling apart. I'm not sat there, unable to support my constituents. There are different reasons for different things, people. Bear with me. Uh, but EU member states pursue their own personal interests, as the lady said over here. Germany has spent more weeks talking about what they're not going to provide to Ukraine than what they are going to provide. France is so busy being the scorned woman that they cannot focus on what they should be doing. And I'm sorry, but yes, we do mock our French allies because that's what we do to each other. Go to any diplomatic summit and I can promise you, you're a French ally and you, you will go tete-a-tete, -tete, you will mock each other, you will have some fun and then hopefully get down to business. 
Hungary is actively advocating against Western support, choosing to focus instead on exasperating tensions taking place with the Hungarian minority in Ukraine. I could go on, but in contrast, the UK and the US have acted swiftly and provided military equipment, intelligence and support, both diplomatic and otherwise. The UK has been the one pushing European nations to do more to support our Ukrainian friends. We've been devising a joint set of economic sanctions, pushing to make sure that people do more. It is overwhelmingly clear who is dragging their feet and who is not. But while we all look at Ukraine, there are other crises on the European continent. Bosnia, where I was last week, the EU has failed to resolve tensions that have been there for 30 years. Worse, some member states, Croatia and Hungary, are actively inflaming ethnic tensions. There is a real risk of conflict within Bosnia. But no one is paying attention, and the EU most certainly is not doing their job on this, because it was the UK who raised the situation there at the NATO ministerial meeting in November. Looking back at Afghanistan, allies will let you down. And I, for one, done cut by WhatsApp was most certainly true. And it was unacceptable. And what we went through was shameful. And all of us, I'm sure, particularly MPs, are still fighting to get people out. But severe as it is, this pales in terms of the longer-term threat we face, which is the rise of China. And we must realise that we are under attack, and that is a hybrid attack. Civil society, universities, business, uh, espionage, everything you can possibly think of is under attack. And there's only one way in which we will make sure that we remain safe, and that is technological uh, supremacy. There is only one country that can help us when it comes to technology to outdo China, and that is America. It is China that are trying to lead on artificial intelligence, gene editing, agri-tech, fintech, you name it. And they are deploying all levers of influence, legal and not, to achieve that. America is the leader in this field currently. Silicon Valley, what possibly could rival that? And we in the UK have these universities, our incredible institutions. There is a Chinese organisation here in Cambridge buying up tiny organizations and businesses as they create the new tech of this world. There are Chinese influencers here, and I say Chinese, I mean the Chinese state, not the Chinese people, I have no truck with them, uh, no conflict with them. The fact is we must protect our technological dominance, because otherwise China will have us at their mercy. Now some countries on the continent, in contrast, are exploring risky Chinese investment. Next year, Montenegro will have its entire debt in the hands of the Chinese government. There are countries around this world where their critical national infrastructure, like airports, are now in Chinese hands. We must stand together with our US partners if we are to deal with the threat of China. Meanwhile, look at what's happening in Lithuania. They've allowed the Taiwanese to set up an embassy. Their European neighbours aren't standing with them. They're not supporting them, but we are. Now, the UK isn't perfect in any of this regard. But we are standing strong against the Chinese Communist Party, and we recognise that to counter the threat, we must work with our staunchest allies. And our staunchest allies are the Five Eyes Alliance. That is our greatest security mechanism and framework. NATO, AUKUS, these defence agreements, the US is the constant there. When we talk about our European allies, let's look at France. We cannot share intelligence in France. When I used to go to Florida to work with the US military, I was only there for a week and yet I was allowed full access to every single part of the military bases. The French, who were posted there permanently for six months at a time, were not allowed to go before the ground, above the ground floor because we could not trust their intelligence and security mechanisms. Look, I've talked predominantly about geopolitical considerations, but I also want to talk about language and culture because whether it is in bunkers in Baghdad or on the front line in Kurdistan or in Ukraine a few weeks ago or anywhere else I've worked, it's the UK and the US who jockey and mock and play together and always come together. And we do this, we have humour, because actually that's when our differences come out. We have so many similarities that it is only through humour where we really see where we divide. Ultimately, our future must lie with the US because that is where we have the greatest capacity to influence a superpower. And the US needs us as much as we need them, please. Well, actually, the leader of Europe point. Mm -hmm. The exact point I was just making was the fact that the US needs us as much as we need them. They need us because we are the ones that provide the nuance, the diplomacy, the utility. When the UK brings together allies around the world, one moment, when the UK brings allies around the world together, people listen. 
the might of this nation, from the peace talks on Syria to working on the global coalition against Daesh. There is no country better than the UK at bringing people together that people trust and listen to, and the US needs us. They might bring the might, the power, and the numbers, but we bring the nuance and the intelligence and the assessment. And I apologise, who was trying to take, come in? Because unfortunately, what we want to happen at great speed doesn't always happen at great speed. This is the reality of politics and the reality of diplomacy. It takes time, it takes detail. These are two great nations. It will take time. Um, I will wrap up by saying it is the UK to whom EU neighbours still come to influence the US. It is to us they come, it is, to inter it is EU ambassadors that come to me and say, please help me influence the US. Not those who are geographically closest, for example, Canada or Mexico. It is the UK. Whether or not we have Churchills and Roosevelts or Thatchers and Reagans or Borises and Bidens, our shared worldview matters. And Britain was America before America. And today we remain brothers in arms, united in values and interests and language, and our shared love of our closest ally across the ocean. Together, we are better, but apart, trust me, the world is more vulnerable. So we absolutely have to maintain our support for our partner, keep challenging them, Demanding they be better, whilst demanding we be better, but we do that best together to protect the people of this country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alicia. Um, wrapping up this evening is Sir David Liddington. Sir David was previously quite down, please, the final speaker. Uh, Sir David was previously the MP for Aylesbury and served as the Minister of State for Europe, Lord Chancellor, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and Minister for the Cabinet Office. Sir David, welcome back. Well, Mr President, thank you for the invitation to come back here. It's uh, Rather a long time since, as a Sydney Sussex undergraduate, I first took part in these debates. I see the, the photographs on the wall behind it. I don't think have changed since my day, <laughs> even if other bits of the Union building have. Um, and could I start by congratulating all the student contributors to our debate this evening, both um, uh, whether as paper speakers or as contributors from the, the back benches and including the, the gallery. I found listening to my friend and uh, a party colleague, um, Alyssa Cairns, that there was a great amount of what she said with which I agreed. And I would not quarrel with those who have spoken for the proposition tonight who have said that the United States has in the past and is still today a key and important ally. But I think that there is a danger in some of the arguments put forward by those speaking on behalf of the motion tonight, that they look only at one part of this country's relationship with the United States of America, and that they look back on the history of our bilateral relationship in a somewhat sentimental way through rosy-tinted spectacles. And Professor Clark, in his opening speech, was quite right to talk about Churchill's response of relief after the US attack on Pearl Harbor and the vital contribution the United States made to the defeat of fascism in Europe, as well as that of Japan. But what he did not say in his remarks was that in the days and weeks immediately after the attack on Pearl Harbor, lend-lease supplies to the United Kingdom and American muni munitions promised uh, to be shipped by convoy to Russia to help in their war effort were both diverted to help resupply and reinforce American forces in the Pacific Ocean. And I think what that story, that, that, that historical uh, story illustrates, is that the United States, perhaps quite reasonably uh, from their point of view, works and makes policy choices according to the interests of the United States of America. And those do not always coincide with those of the United Kingdom. And if we look at what happened in uh, 
1919. Woodrow Wilson came to Europe, took part in the negotiation of the Treaty of Versailles, championed the foundation of the League of Nations, but then was unable to persuade the United States Senate to ratify that treaty or to agree to United States membership of the League, making that forerunner of the United Nations much weaker than would otherwise have been the case. Throughout the 1930s into the 1940s, a powerful isolationist movement within US politics campaigned vigorously against any alliance with the European democracies against the rising forces of fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. And right up in, you know, in, into the 1940 presidential election, Roosevelt, FDR, was arguing that he would not be sending your boys into any foreign wars. Once the war was concluded and the Allies victorious, Lend-Lease was cut off almost immediately. And the Truman administration agreed to give a desperately needed loan to the post-war Attlee government only under the most penal economic conditions, forcing even worse austerity upon an already beleaguered UK population. Or we can go to more recent years. Yes, the great friendship between Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Um, a fierce sort contest within the US administration over what stance they should take on the Falklands. But Reagan sending US forces in to topple the government of Grenada, a Commonwealth country with then the Queen still as head of state, without bothering to inform the British Prime Minister, even though they had the closest of political relationships at that time. And then, as others have alluded to, uh, only uh, most recently, President Biden's uh, decisions about withdrawal from Afghanistan without consulting London or any other ally. Zach. You talk about, a lot about America's unilateral foreign policy, and, and you're right to point out that America is at times acting in self-interest. I don't think anyone's denying that. But so is Europe. I mean, you've only got to look at Gaul repeatedly vetoing Britain's position within the emerging European community. There have been many times where France, where Germany, where, mi where dozens of European powers have taken strategic decisions without consulting European partners that have got us bogged down in their mess. So yes, America might be damned, but so is Europe. So why, in fact, is Europe any better than the United States on this regard? Oh, my argument is that the United Kingdom should be looking to the interests predominantly and, and first of the people of the United Kingdom. And yes, that does mean looking for alliances in, with the United States and some of the other democracies around the world that have been mentioned in the debate, but it also means, critically, establishing a close, strategic, constructive partnership with our closest democratic friends and neighbours on the continent of Europe, with whom, sadly, we have become too estranged in recent years. And my starting point, if you like, is the analysis given in the uh, the Integrated Review, published by this government last year, which describes the United Kingdom as a European power, a European power with global interests. And both parts of that statement are true. And it went on to say that the preponderance of our interests and our commitment as far as security was concerned was going to remain in the Euro-Atlantic region of the world, despite a, a measured, but only a measured and limited, tilt to the Indo-Pacific. And I think that the question of US interests is um, important because, I mean, Zach Martin, in, in an excellent speech, um, spoke of how we should put our trust in the United States because they and they alone would be able to uh, provide the security assurances we needed. And yet I think after our experience of the Trump presidency, I am more concerned than ever before as to the reliability of those promises into the future. We know that President Trump came very near to pulling the United States out of NATO altogether. In 2024, it is perfectly possible that we see a second Trump term, this time unconstrained by any fears of the need to seek re-election, or the election of a Trump acolyte uh, seeking to emulate and exceed. Uh, already we've seen Senator Hawley, one of uh, Trump's key followers, uh, say that um, a deal should be done by Washington with Putin and that the US should accept that Ukraine should be part of the Russian sphere of influence. And so I think it is dangerous to put our, all our eggs in the Washington basket. And we do have important relationships with Europe 
there are two European democracies that have both global interest and a willingness and will to act in the world, the United Kingdom and France. And it is if the two of us are able to work together that we can generate a more effective European pillar of the transatlantic alliance. Because even if we don't see Trump, even a Democrat president is going to look more and more to the Indo-Pacific, is going to use the US's self-sufficiency in energy as a reason to take less interest in certain parts of the world that they did in the past. Places like the Western Balkans, which Alyssa Cairns was quite right to highlight. Play, play, it's, yeah, please, come. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you're right, but I think that people who are taking decisions about the future security of the United Kingdom have to ensure ourselves against the real risk, if I look at the American polls, of that happening again. But even a more outward-looking president is going to focus less on Europe, less on the European neighbourhood of the Balkans or North Africa or, or sub-Saharan Africa, where we might be needed to, to assist in a, in a, against jihadis or to, for humanitarian relief. And that is why the European countries, where the United Kingdom should play a leadership role, are in the, the, the position where we need to come forward and have the kind of effective uh, presence uh, internationally that I agree we, we do not uh, have sufficiently at the moment. What about Le Pen in France? Would France mm -hmm. then be such a reliable partner? Because that is the risk we are looking at currently, where I would argue France would be more dangerous of a partner than America under Biden, or hopefully not Trump again when he returns. No, I, I, I completely agree. I think if I look at the French polls uh, and the predictions for the second round under any hypothetical outcome, I think that there is much less risk of Le Pen being elected in France than there is of Trump being re-elected for a second term in the United States. Um, that I, I'm being told I have a minute uh, left to go. So if, if the gentleman will forgive me, uh, I'll let go. I'll come in very briefly, and I'll, I'll, if you'll let me have a little bit more leeway. Go on. This is the, the, and frankly, the fishing rights in the channel is tiresome, uh, but this is, a, this is something which, frankly, should have been sorted out months ago in negotiations, uh, and which I'm confident will be sorted out once we're free of the French presidential elections. I think at the moment, just the, polit the politics makes this, this all too, too, uh, too difficult to, to do. Um, the European countries have assets, particularly soft power, but through NATO, hard power assets as well. But in soft power, to take on the Chinese strategic technological challenge, things like sanctions, things like incentives and uh, disincentives for investment, uh, scrutiny of takeovers and mergers, uh, controls over trade, contributions to global standards bodies where the Chinese are seeking to get their people and supporters in, in a big way, is going to be critically important. On these things, the EU and the US are now starting to sit down together and try to thrash out a common approach to deal with that Chinese technological strategic challenge. I want the UK to be in the room. We're not going to be invited in by the United States except to sit there as an observer. We're outside the EU now. I regret that, but that's a decision that the British people took. I think now we need to construct that strategic partnership with our European neighbours, friends and democratic allies to amplify our influence in meeting those global strategic challenges. That is how we put flesh on this vision of the United Kingdom as a European power with global interests to, to secure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to David. That brings us to the close of the debate. Just before everyone goes, um, I should say that uh, next week the debate is on the monarchy, isn't it? Yes. 
it's on the monarchy, um, and there's, have a look in our term card, there's some controversial good events coming up next week. Um, you know this, uh, we vote with our feet, there's an I door, there's a no door, and an abstain door. I have no idea which way this is going to go, but please can we give our paper speakers a round of applause. Good night.